Well, on, uh, on Friday night, we followed the story of Jesus' birth. We read, uh, we read about the announcement of the angel to Mary uh, and, then to, and then of Mary's visit to Elizabeth and of the angel's announcement to Joseph. Mary and Joseph go to Bethlehem to be registered and Jesus is born while they are there. Shepherds visit him on the night of his birth and then some time after his birth, probably about a couple of years later, he received visitors from the east. Uh, he received the, who we often call the wise men, the magi, who were likely a sort of priestly class from Babylon who had learned about the prophecies of the Jews while they were in captivity in Babylon, knew about the promise of a king that would be met with a bright morning star, saw a new and and wondrous star in the sky, and so came to see the good news, to see the king who had been born. And it's in the, the circumstances of their visit that lead to another one of the early childhood stories of Jesus that we're going to consider this morning. The, the, the Magi, the wise men, they come to see Jesus. They come to find the child who has been born. They visit King Herod on their way in to try to find, the, uh, find the, the place where the king has been born. And they're told to go to Bethlehem. And Herod tells them, search diligently for the child. And when you find him, let me know so that I can come and worship him as well. But Herod isn't interested in worship. He's worried that this child might gain the support of the people, become a usurper, and and take his place. He wants to have him killed. And so that leads to what happens in the aftermath of the birth of Jesus. It's known as the slaughter of the innocents. Herod has all the male children in the area around Bethlehem killed, who are two years and under to try to do away with this who he thinks is a pretender to the throne. But Joseph is warned in a dream that this is going to happen, and so the family runs away to Egypt. They spend some time safely in Egypt until Herod dies, and it's safe to come back. And that's where we're going to pick up the story of Jesus this morning. It's in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 2, and we're going to read verses 19 through 23. Matthew 2 19 to 23. But when Herod died, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Rise, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, for those who sought the child's life are dead. And he rose and took the child and his mother and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there, and being warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee. And he went and lived in a city called Nazareth, so that what was spoken by the prophets might be fulfilled, that he would be called a Nazarene. Let's pray. Father, we read this story that perhaps we have um, read before maybe many times, and I think to me often seems like a transition story, uh, that it's simply setting up the next important thing that is to come, while it itself isn't all that meaningful in the life of Jesus. But I pray that you would teach me, teach us otherwise this morning that your Holy Spirit would open up your word to us and would show us the good and wondrous things about the Lord Jesus that you are teaching us here in this story. So we pray, bless your word, attend your word with the work of the Holy Spirit. Teach us truly, we ask. In Jesus' name, amen. First, I want to want to talk about this story and about, well, all the life of Jesus, but especially the early life of Jesus and the role that, that, div- that divine intervention plays in some of the most important events 
of Jesus' early life. Look, look at the way that God shows up in some of the circumstances here. Look again, verses 19 through 22. But when Herod died, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Rise, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel. For those who sought the child's life are dead. And he rose and took the child and his mother and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. And being warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee. Following the visit of the wise men, Joseph was warned in a dream by an angel of the Lord that Herod was about to try to kill Jesus. So Joseph and Mary and Jesus, they leave Bethlehem and they fled to Egypt. They stayed there during the the slaughter of the innocents as Herod had all the male children under two years old killed in Bethlehem and in the surrounding region. Evidently, God understood that that danger still remained while King Herod was still alive. And so the Lord had Joseph and Mary and Jesus remain in Egypt for a time while Herod was still alive. Once Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared again to Joseph, telling him that it was safe to return to Israel. But Joseph later learned that Herod's son, Herod Archelaus, was now ruling in Judea. In fact, Upon the death of Herod the Great, his dad, his son Archelaus had been made ethnarch of Judea and Samaria and Idumea, the whole sort of southern portion of, of Israel and across, across the Jordan River as well. And his son Archelaus was already pretty well known for his brutality. He was not nicer than his dad. So being warned again in a dream... Joseph took his family north of Samaria to Galilee. Galilee was now being ruled by Herod the Tetrarch, or Herod Antipas, as he's often called. He was known to be more political, more accommodating, and so he was clearly the safer option of the two. So Joseph and his family settle in the region of Galilee. And aside from Jesus' own virginal conception and the appearance of the angel to Mary and the appearance of the star as a sign of Jesus' birth, it's incredible to note the amount of divine intervention that happens in this story in Jesus' early life. God shows up in a dream to tell Joseph to take his family and get down to Egypt. And then they stay there for a while. And then God appears in a dream again to Joseph and tells him that it's safe to go home. And then they're on their way and he appears again in a dream to Joseph to tell him to go to Galilee to, uh, to avoid Herod Archelaus. God normally rules the world through his providence and his his, his ordinary providence, as we call it, is, is evident in the laws of nature. God has set up a world that works a certain way. There are predictable things that will happen with water and rain and in Edmonton, snow and weather and all of these various things that, that, that work together to make the world in which we live, that make the, the laws of nature and, and the sort of the predictable things about the world in which we live, where you can plant seeds and food will grow and you can farm them and you can grow animals and you can butcher them and cook the meat and it will give you the nutrients that you need to live. These are the ordinary ways that God governs his world. He's made the world to work a certain way so that it is generally a habitable place for us, even though it's marred by sin. Even throughout most of the scriptures, things like prophetic visions and revelatory dreams and the appearances of angels or God speaking directly to people isn't the norm. Those things happened very rarely. We know about them because they're given to us in the Bible, but, but those, those occurrences were pretty rare. But now we get to the early years of Jesus' life, and they are happening all the time. 
They hadn't been happening at all, in fact, for about four or five hundred years prior to the arrival of Jesus. But now, now, we have an angel appearing to Zechariah to tell him about John the Baptist's birth, and an angel appearing to Mary to tell her of Jesus' birth, and an angel appearing to Joseph in a dream telling him not to divorce Mary. And Zechariah prophesies at the birth of his son, and angels appear to the shepherds announcing Jesus' birth, and the wise men are warned in a dream not to return to Herod, and Joseph is warned in a dream to flee to Egypt, and Joseph is told in another dream that he can return to Israel, and told in one more dream to settle in Galilee. The life and work of Jesus is clearly designed and then protected by God himself. These things that had been so rare beforehand now are happening in huge clusters around the arrival of Jesus. Something incredibly important is happening with this child and God is intervening in supernatural and uncommon ways to make sure that Jesus achieves the purpose for which he was sent. God wasn't willing to let his mission in the world be thwarted by the paranoid, addled mind of Herod the Great or even his son Archelaus. He wasn't going to let them stand in the way of the completion of his purpose. And so God remains involved and he even intervenes regularly many times in the events of history when necessary in order to achieve his purposes. And I think we ought to find comfort in that. By all human accounts, Jesus should have died at two years old. Given the size of Bethlehem and the surrounding area, he should have been among the 20 or so male children who were likely murdered at the hands of Herod the Great. And yet, an angel appears to Joseph in a dream several times to bring about the flight to Egypt and then, and then the return to Galilee. I say that we ought to find comfort in that because God has promised us several things too. He's promised to complete the work in us that he has begun. He promises that we'll be with him when we die, a promise that was fulfilled for Camellia just this morning. He promises that he'll raise our bodies to eternal life, and he promises that he'll make this world new, free from suffering and pain and death, and by all human accounts, those things will never happen. As the hymn says, we're prone to wander and prone to leave the God we love. On our own, there's no hope of a blessed eternal life. And on our own, we cannot make this world a perfect place. We may try to make the world better, which is an admirable goal, but it seems any time we try to fix a problem, we end up making three new ones in its place. And there's still this problem that we as a species seem to be natural-born liars and connivers and thieves and killers, and without divine intervention, none of these promises come to pass. And yet what we see is that God is not only able but willing to intervene in his world in order to bring his plan to fruition. If Herod kills Jesus as a baby, there's no life of perfect obedience, no sacrificial death, and no proclamation of the kingdom of God, no resurrection from the dead. In short, the whole thing falls apart. But God intervened to see it through. And he's given us the Holy Spirit to see us through this life and into the next. He intervenes in individual lives to take hearts that were stony and dead and didn't want to listen to him and were turned in on ourselves and only wanted to care about our own interests, and instead he makes them alive. Alive to him, able to hear him, wanting to believe in him, to follow him. He changes us so that we have faith in his son, and so that we can listen to him and become like him. He intervenes in the life of every single person who truly believes in his son, and he'll intervene again by sending his son to return to judge the world and to make it new. He has been and will continue to be 
faithful to his promises. And even when there are forces in this world and forces in our lives that by all human accounts should mess up his plans and keep the good things that he has intended from happening. God is powerful and able and willing to step into this world, step into our stories and see to it that his purposes are achieved. If you doubt that the good promised for you can truly come to be, if it seems like the circumstances of this world or the particular moment of your life that you are in are too backwards, too difficult, too dark, too far gone to see God's good done in it, take heart that God is strong and able to do what he intends, to see his will come to pass, to make sure that his promises are fulfilled. Just look at the events surrounding the birth of Jesus. Your God is able and willing, and he is worthy of your trust. So that's the first thing. Jesus and divine intervention. Look at all the things that God does around the birth of his son to make sure that he achieves the purpose for which he was sent. And the second thing, Jesus and divine condescension. Look at the last verse of that passage we read this morning. Verse 23. And he went and lived in a city called Nazareth so that what was spoken by the prophets might be fulfilled, that he would be called a Nazarene. So the family ends up in Galilee, which is a whole region in northern Israel. And they, they in particular, end up in a town called Nazareth. And Matthew says that this fulfilled what was spoken by the prophets, that he would be called a Nazarene. But here's the thing. If you try to find an Old Testament prophecy that says he will be called a Nazarene, you won't find it. You'll be looking for a long time. There's no such specific prophecy. So what on earth is Matthew talking about? He phrases this thing that he says a little bit unusually. He doesn't follow the sort of typical pattern that you might expect when, when one of the New Testament offers, authors quotes from one of the Old Testament prophets, which they do quite a bit. But ordinarily, you might, you might hear them say something like, the prophet, and then you name them, says, and then they quote from that or paraphrase from that, uh, from that uh, prophet's work. But there's no prophet mentioned here. He just says, as the prophets say. And then he says, what was, he says, uh, what was, what was said among the prophets that he would be called a Nazarene? He seems to be referring not necessarily to some specific prophecy, but to a general idea that was given to us from a number of the prophets. So what would Matthew be trying to tell us then? What general idea could he be pointing to when he says that the prophets tell us that the Messiah would be called a Nazarene? Well, a few things. We know from the New Testament, in particular, we know from the Gospel of John, that Nazareth was looked down on throughout most of Israel. Um, you don't need to turn there, but very quickly, in John chapter 7, John chapter 7, verses uh, 40 through 42, say this. John 7, 40 to 42. When they heard these words, some of the people said, this really is the prophet, talking about Jesus. Others said, this is the Christ. But some of them said, is the Christ to come from Galilee? Has not the scripture said that the Christ comes from the offspring of David and comes from Bethlehem, the village where David was? And then if you turn over to verse 52 there, they finish the thought. They replied, are you from Galilee too? Search and see that no prophet arises from Galilee. So there's already some suspicion attached to Jesus being from this, this region in northern Israel. And then 
uh, go on, uh, go back to John chapter 1. John chapter 1, verse 46 says, Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Having heard that Jesus is from Nazareth. And Philip said to him, Come and see. Okay, so this is a fellow Galilean in John chapter 1. Galilee, which is already looked down on in the rest of Israel, uh, saying, Can anything good come? come out of Nazareth. Galilee in general and Nazareth in particular were looked down on as backwards, good-for-nothing, despicable places. Nothing good comes from there. People from other places knew they were better simply because they were from other places. And especially because they weren't from Nazareth. This is also where Mary and Joseph were from originally. So Jesus is born into a low family of not much social esteem, and he grows up in a low place, a place that is looked down on by everyone else around him. And we know that the prophets foretold that the Messiah would be rejected and despised. Uh, Just a few places. Psalm 22, Psalm 22, verses 6 through 8 says, uh, speaking of the Messiah, but I am a worm and not a man, scorned by mankind and despised by the people. All who see me mock me, they make mouths at me, they wag their heads. He trusts in the Lord, let him deliver him, let him rescue him, for he delights in him. Okay? A worm and not a man, scorned and despised by the people. Or turn over to the prophet Isaiah. There are a couple of instances there. Isaiah chapter 49 and verse 7. Thus says the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel and His Holy One, to the deeply despised, abhorred by the nation, the servant of rulers, king shall see and arise, princes, and they shall prostrate themselves because of the Lord who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel. He has chosen you. This is spoken of the Lord's chosen servant, the Messiah. Jesus calls him one deeply despised and abhorred by the nation. And one more place, still in Isaiah chapter 53, verses 2 and 3. For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. As one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. It is a regular fixture throughout the prophets that the Messiah is going to appear to be no one special, and that he will generally be looked down upon and despised by other people. And here is Jesus settling for his early years in a place that is looked down on and despised by other people. He chooses the humblest of circumstances in which to come up. And even in his early ministry, we have other people saying, well, he can't be the one. He's from Nazareth. What good comes from Nazareth? The prophets in general make it clear that the Messiah will have nothing, will be of no significance, will have nothing particularly special or grand about him, and will be generally despised and rejected by the people. And in Matthew's day, if you wanted to sum up someone like that in one word, you called them a Nazarene. Have you ever wondered why Jesus seemed to have such special concern for those who were poor, for those who were considered outcasts or unclean, those who were considered unfit by the respected of society, since he spent so much of his time with tax collectors who were hated and lepers who were unclean, and women and children who were considered second-class citizens in that day, and those who were on the margins. There are are many reasons, but one of those reasons that he identified with them so closely is because he was one of them. 
Jesus grew up as a man who was considered low class, unrefined, not special, from a backwoods, backwards place. This is why, historically anyway, Christians have identified with Jesus as caring for the outcast and have, so have, have cared for the sick and taken pains not to spread disease and taken in abandoned babies and given to and ministered to the poor and counted any among their number who would confess Jesus as Lord. It's so important for us to remember this because it's so easy to get wrapped up in our cultural understanding of what the good life is. And even, even Christmas time in our minds has come to be associated with lavish displays of wealth that only the very best off can afford, which isn't bad in and of itself. It's good to feast and give gifts in honor of the Lord Jesus but it's bad if it makes us forget that Jesus was born and lived among the lowest. He counted them his brothers and he showed special concern for them during his ministry. If Jesus was born into 21st century Edmonton, if the time was right for the Messiah to arrive and it was here in Alberta, in Edmonton, in this year, he's not going to be born in a... In a, in a spacious home in Crestwood or in Glenora or in a birthing suite at the Grey Nuns. He'd be born in a, in a dirty bathtub in Macaulay or Boyle Street. So is it any wonder that Jesus says that clothing the naked and feeding the hungry and visiting the sick and welcoming the stranger and giving drink to the thirsty and seeing those in prison is ministering to him? That whatever we do to the least of these, we do to him. He cared for them because he was one of them. Jesus said, foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Jesus lived much of his life off the generosity of others. He wasn't destitute or anything like that. Throughout his ministry, he likely had a home in Capernaum, but he spent most of his time as an itinerant preacher. And so he slept in other people's homes and he ate at other people's tables. So does Jesus even leave us the option of ignoring such people around us or as looking down on them as lesser? Rather, Jesus... Jesus commands us to see in their face his own gaze and to ask ourselves, who are our Nazarenes and how can they be objects of our love and our kindness? I had this conversation particularly about this aspect of, uh, of Jesus' ministry and this, this aspect of Jesus' story and his growing up in Nazareth with one of my, um, one of my professors in seminary. You may have read some of the books he's, he's written. His name is Jerem Bars, and a few, of you, a few of you met him in Canmore a few years ago. And he said that for some reason, this aspect of Jesus' ministry had really taken root in his kids' hearts when they were younger. Um, and so they all kind of made it a habit of befriending the kids at school who were picked on or who were thought weird or who didn't fit in. Uh, and, and that their home had, their home had become the, the hangout for sort of all of the local misfits, that their home was the island of, of, of misfit toys in their neighborhood. And, uh, and man, the first time that I heard him tell the story, it just, it just kind of moved me to tears. Um, because, well, for several reasons. Because I think we, we, think, we think of things like... Um, uh, of, of ministering to those in need, of dealing with issues like poverty or even just being on sort of the, 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 the outside socially. And we think, them as, we think of them as huge global problems that require huge global solutions and they're, 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 it's way bigger than any of us could ever deal with and, and all of those things. And yet there are, often, there are often very simple local ways, even in our own neighborhoods, that we can address things like this. And you don't need to be a PhD or have particular power to take steps to do these 
these sorts of things. It's, it's, it's even available to our youngest folks. It's available to our kids who are in school simply to show kindness to the kid who always eats lunch alone uh, or to, to befriend the one who's always picked on by everybody else. These are things that are exactly like Jesus, and these are the kinds of kindnesses that were shown to Jesus throughout his life. And so may our hearts and our homes and our churches be the places where the Nazarenes among us are always welcome and always belong. And in so doing, we identify with the Lord and we worship him and we let the kindness of Jesus be known to those who are otherwise on the outs, to those who need to hear it the most. Let's pray. Father, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the miraculous ways that you showed up in his early life to see that your purposes would stand, that his life would be spared, that he could achieve the purpose for which you sent him, the ways that that you intervened in history to see your will come to pass. And so we pray that you will help us to trust you as the one who is powerful and good, the one who is mighty and able to work his will even in the most impossible of circumstances. And so knowing that this is who you are and what you are like, help us also to Love and care for those who are the the Nazarenes in our world. Thank you for students who show love to the unpopular kids in in their schools. Thank you for organizations like Hope Mission and Mustard Seed and many others who work among the poor and the homeless in our city. Thank you for for churches and for other organizations who seek to be a caring presence in their neighborhood. And we pray for each one of us, for the people we know in our lives, at work, in our neighborhoods, in our families, in our acquaintances, that those who are in need of special care a dose of love, friendship where it is sometimes missing, would would receive it and would offer it to others for the sake of making the love of Jesus known. Thank you for the love and the care that he has shown to us that while we were outsiders, while we were his enemies, while we were deserving of nothing good from him, He came to live and die and rise so that we might be welcomed into his family and know his love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.